السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. We'll be starting the <coughs> the uh, seventh session shortly. So just um, waiting for a few people to join before we launch, inshallah. Uh, Don Parker, wa alaykum salam. Florina Rahman, wa alaykum salam. Tabish Suhail, wa alaykum salam. Madiha, Jim Roney, Bangladesh, wa alaykum salam. Daoud Duni, wa alaykum salam. <coughs> Abu Bakr, Elizabeth Shah. Mohsin Nahir from Bangladesh. I guess a lot of Bangladeshis are um, online. MashaAllah. Aminu. Uh, Muhammad Wahid. Ramadan Mubarak to all of you. Nasra. Sayida. Chaudhry. Bangladesh. Tawheedul Haq from Bangladesh. MashaAllah. Fahim Sajjad, Pakistan. UK. Muhammad Wahid. Welcome, all of you. Inshallah, I guess that's enough people to get the ball rolling. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulihi al-kareem Wa ala alihi wa ashabi Wa man istanna bi sunnatihi ila yawm al All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. We'll begin, we are beginning now our uh, seventh session, seventh session in which we'll be looking at the eighth name among the names of Allah, the 99 that we will be covering in this series. <clears throat> And uh, this name is As-Salam, and uh, it is found in the Quran, and the uh, location in the Quran is only once in Surah Al-Hashr. In terms of the meaning, because as we said, you know, Allah instructed us to call on Him through or with these names. So for us to be able to call on him, worship him, utilizing this name as salam, it is important for us to understand its meaning. Yes, we say salam alaikum every time, every day, but when we're doing that, that's not actually um, calling on Allah by his name, that name. Specifically, that as-salam is being used in a different context. So, to understand, uh, we need to understand the root of the meaning, the root meaning of this name, as-salam. It comes from salam as well as from salama. And uh, in the Arabic context, it means what is free from defect, safe, and well-being. All of these meanings are included. What is free from defect, that's like Al-Quddus that we took already, that element is there, and it is also safe or safety, a state of safety, and the third meaning is that of well-being. So when the greeting salam alaikum is given, it means fundamentally that one is guaranteeing safety from their side to the person who they're giving the salams to and declaring that there is no hostility, there's an absence of hostility in uh, dealing with them. 
Now, with respect to Allah, the name means, on one hand, that Allah is free from any defects, as we said, like Al-Quddus and deficiencies, and also that he will greet the believers in paradise with salam, saying, Salamun qawlan min rabbi, min rabbi rahim Peace, a greeting from the most merciful Lord. So, Allah is the source of peace and safety. And in order now to apply this name, fundamentally, we can say that we should adopt peace in our dealings with people. Right? As Allah teaches us through his own merciful way of dealing with us, we, in dealing with others, should treat them peacefully. We should be a peace-loving people. And that's what Muslims fundamentally are, peace-loving people. However, it is the media uh, distortion through politicians and others that have painted Muslims as uh, violent, uh, uh, people who love blood, you know, so anything that is connected, they say, okay, chopping off hands means that we're bloodthirsty. You know, the fact that we slaughter our animals before eating them, we do them ourselves. So look, these people are just bloodthirsty people. I mean, but this is, uh, of course, distortion. I mean, our method of slaughter is far more humane than the methods used uh, in the West. Or in, in other societies. Secondly, what is unique of that name, Salam, free from defect, obviously, is not applicable to human beings. We can't make that claim for ourselves. But we affirm it for Allah. And belief in this divine name Believing that Allah is the bestower of peace. This peace that we're speaking about, the ultimate peace, is that of paradise. In the next life, there is peace in this life which he has given us at different points, etc. But the peace of paradise will be Peace which is everlasting. Uh, the believer has to live in this life contented with the self-imposed prison which he or she puts on himself or herself. While the disbeliever is free to enjoy life and do it as he or she wishes. The Prophet ﷺ compared this life to a prison in the hadith narrated by Abu Hurairah, in which he said, This world is a prison for the believer and paradise for the disbeliever. A dunya sijnul mu'min wa jannatul kafir. This is the basic uh, description of how we have to consider and address this life. It is a self-imposed prison. It's a prison that if we chose not to stay, we could leave anytime. But believing that the sacrifice of living 
con in this confined way, it will bring us ultimate peace in the life to come, then we do it happily. And in any case, what Allah has prescribed has been for our benefit. Because the things which Allah has forbidden, whether it's alcohol, whether it's riba, interest, or whether it is fornication, murder, all of these things are harmful things to society, to individuals as well as to the society as a whole. So us restraining ourselves from being engaged in these practices is for our own betterment. And it makes for a better life in general. Where do we find the sense of calm and inner peace from the pleasures of the world, cocaine, music festivals, bars, etc. Is, is this what will give us internal peace? Ah, it's pleasure. There's pleasure in it. But it's short-lived pleasure. It's not pleasure that just stays with you. When you have inner peace, then it's going to be with you all the time, not just for a minute. And this is why Allah informed us in the Quran, Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'inna al It is only with the remembrance of Allah that hearts truly find rest. It is through the remembrance of Allah. So that prison that we create for ourselves it's one based on the remembrance of Allah. Remembering what Allah has in store for us. Remembering Allah's instructions to us and what it does for us in this life, etc. But it's through that remembrance that ultimately our souls will find true rest. Now, in terms of the safety or we could say the absence of, of, of harm being conveyed to those around us, based on this divine name, we said this name as Salam from Allah, it also represents safety that peace, etc., is one issue, but safety, that we treat people in a manner where they feel safe. We prevent harm from them by keeping them safe. And the Prophet ﷺ described this as a part of the Muslim character, a basic part of the Muslim character. When he said, the true Muslim is one whose tongue and hand Muslims are safe from. Al Muslim, man salim al Muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadi. This is the true Muslim. His, lis his lisan, his tongue, his uh, cursing people, speaking ill of them, backbiting, all the different things that comes from the tongue that is harm. And hand stealing their properties you know, hitting them, harming them in that way, murder, all these other uh, physical activities that may involve harm in, in other human beings. So a true Muslim is one who is free from this, is not engaged in this. So by describing the true Muslim in that way, this principle of salam, Muslims being people of salam or peace, peace-loving people. This is a part and parcel of our way of life, which is taken from the name as salam 
belonging to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In terms of praying using his name, because remember that Allah had uh, informed us, لِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ husna فَدْعُوهُ biha. Allah has the most beautiful names, so call on him using them. So, uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallam taught us how to use uh, the name Salam in our prayers, uh, telling us that after our daily prayers, we should ask Allah's forgiveness three times, saying Astaghfirullah, sincerely, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, I seek forgiveness from you, O Allah. Then we say this supplication, this uh, dua, which is a remembrance of Allah at the same time, and it involves Allah's name. We should say, Allahumma anta salam, wa minka salam. Tabarakta ya dal jalali wal ikram. O Allah, you are peace, and peace comes from you. May you be blessed, O owner of glory and grace. O Allah, you are peace, and salam. And peace comes from you, O minka salam. May you be blessed, Tabarakta ya dal jalali wal ikram, O owner of glory and grace. So this is a dua worth learning, one which was taught by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we should utilize it after our daily prayers. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the same time also encouraged the spreading of peace by frequently greeting each other with salams. Abu Huraira quoted the Prophet as saying, you will not enter paradise until you believe. And you will not believe until you love each other. Shall I not guide you to something which if you did it, you will love each other? Spread the greetings of peace among yourselves. Afshu baynakum as-salam. Or afshu as-salam baynakum. Spread peace amongst you. That is the greetings of peace. As-salam. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And the spreading of peace greetings is an important Islamic custom which bonds the society together. It is so important that the Prophet ﷺ gave details as to the protocol of giving greetings in order for it not to be confined to commoners uh, and greeting the nobles. Meaning that you give your salams to the Nobles, but not the common people. You'll walk by, you, you ignore them, people you don't know, etc. But if there's somebody who is obviously an important person, they look like an important person and everything, you quickly, Salaam Alaikum. This is not the way. The Prophet Sallallahu said, the young should greet the elders. So this is the protocol now. Who should greet first? Because, okay, young and elders come together. Who should greet first? According to the Prophet ﷺ, the younger should give greetings to the elders with peace. The passerby should greet the one sitting. Again, somebody sitting down in a circumstance and you come walking in, walking by them, then you who are walking by, you have the first right 
or obligation to greet those who are sitting. And the smaller group should greet the larger group. If you are two or three people and you come upon 10 people, then you as the smaller group should give the greetings to the larger. And he also said that the one riding should greet the one walking. The one walking is walking along. The one riding is obviously coming up, coming up to them. So him up there, might, one might think that he's sitting up there. Usually the one sitting on the horse will be the one in a uh, superior position, etc. But the Prophet ﷺ said no. That one up there should give greetings of salams to the one who is walking. And the one walking should give salams to the one sitting. And he also, the Prophet ﷺ, on another occasion, he gave superiority to the one who greets those who they know and those who they don't know. Greeting those who you know and those who you don't know. Greeting those who you know, that's easy. People do that all the time. It's natural. But greeting those who you don't know, you know, people tend to ignore those who they don't know. And the giving of peace was something not unique to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu He was not the only one doing it. The prophets did it. You can find, uh, in, even in the Gospels, as distorted as they are, we can't rely on them as sources of, of uh, correct, or completely correct information, but there is some truth in them. It states there in the chapter 20, verse 19, Jesus sent to them again, Peace be with you, said to them, Jesus, said to the people, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. He gave peace. That's he, he greeted. And actually the Jews, even to, today in their language, because it's a sister language of Arabic, Shalom Aleichem, this is the uh, greeting which they, they greet each other with. And this is from the uh, practice of Jesus and from the practice of the earlier prophets. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, in terms of giving salams, we can say basically giving salams to human beings is fine, great, but giving salams to Allah is not appropriate. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud related that they used to pray behind the Prophet وسلم, and say, As-salamu ala Allah. And the Prophet وسلم, said, Indeed, Allah is the bestower of peace. So, you shouldn't say that. Better that you say, Tahiyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibatu. As-salamu alayka ayyuha nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As-salamu alayna wa ala ibadillah as-salihin. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. So this giving salams to Allah, companions did it thinking that it was a good thing. Some of them did. And the Prophet ﷺ clarified, no, it's not appropriate. Right? We can't give peace to Allah. And Allah is the giver of peace. We said, as salam, this name, the meaning is that he is the bestower of peace. So the Prophet ﷺ connect, collect, corrected the companions uh, in those uh, times, in his time, uh, from doing that. So naturally, likewise, we would be expected to avoid that. So, 
that uh, concludes basically what we were to discuss regarding this name Assalam. Uh, following the four principles of adopting it where applicable that is we treat people peacefully and we give salams to them what is unique and, and uh, special to Allah we affirm as the Prophet Sallallahu did he uh, disallowed giving salams to Allah instead giving salams to uh, our fellow Muslims whether we know them or we don't know them whether they're of great status or children also in the giving of salams the law being the bestower of peace and that ultimate peace is the peace of paradise we should take from that name hope for paradise Allah has prescribed the giving of salams for us reminding us of the paradise to come in which we will find the fullness of salam and at the same time because he is the one who bestows salam peace we have to avoid whatever is going to prevent that peace from reaching us and that is whatever Allah has forbidden because we will not find peace in what he has forbidden. So as we practice in Ramadan to control ourselves, our appetites, our desires, etc. This is so that outside of Ramadan, we would be able to control ourselves from those things which were prohibited by Allah. And when we do so, we should find some element of peace in our lives, knowing that we have obeyed Allah and that He is the ultimate bestower of peace. So with that, uh, we will close this session covering having covered the eighth name and I know at the pace that we're going you might be thinking again are we going to be able to finish the 99 in Ramadan well as I said if we don't in Ramadan we will try to keep it going and finish it after Ramadan but inshallah we'll try to do as many many as we can in this month now, before closing the session, I will look at some of your questions and um, answer them. And again, remember, please, we focus on questions which are related to our topic. I know there's many things you'd like to ask about. Somebody was asking about cremation, you know. Um, but from yesterday's... Uh, from yesterday's questions um, we mentioned regarding Allah's name Al-Quddus which is the one free from any kind of deficiency etc and so uh, our brother Tabish Suhail had asked the question but it was too late uh, about the use of the the, the name or the phrase Ruh al Qudus for Angel Gabriel, Jibril. So, how is it that you know the angel is called Qudus? No, this phrase Ruh al Qudus, Ruh is the spirit, the spirit being who was sent by 
Al-Qudus. That is Allah. He is the spirit sent by Allah. Not that the, the spirit is holy. Allah is holy. So it is the spirit of the holy, meaning the spirit sent by the holy. Okay, there's a question. I guess this is sort of Ramadan related. Um, <clears throat> concerning, uh, uh, Sister Monica is asking if smoking is haram, what about chemical food or drink that we consume? Is it not the same? smoking no there is harm in sugar artificial drinks etc there is harm in large quantities this is where the harm lies smoking is a different category altogether smoking causes cancer this is already proven fact. This is not opinion. And cancer causes death. Therefore, smoking causes death. Because of that, Allah has already told us clearly in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Don't kill yourselves. We know something will kill us. It's not permissible to take it. Chemicals in food and drink. If we take it in small quantities, it's not going to kill us. It's not the same thing at all. But of course, we should look after our health and avoid taking things which we know are harmful. That's a given as we in Islam are not allowed to kill ourselves or to harm ourselves. So we <clears throat> avoid a lot of sugar, sugary drinks, artificial uh, foods, you know, genetically modified, etc. As much as we can, we avoid these things. But smoking is like taking alcohol. It's on the same kind of level of, of prohibition. Okay. Um, I think that's the... And of course, you know, people who avoid cigarettes during Ramadan in the fasting hours and as soon as the time comes to break fast they break fast with a cigarette <laughs> you know allah uh, yahdikum you know may allah guide you all because this is you know this should be a time to get up all together that's what Ramadan is an opportunity for you to tackle this bad habit and uh i know people say i'm just addicted i can't help it uh, my father accepted Islam when he was 40 years old, in his 40s. Sorry, in his 50s. And he had been smoking for most of his life. About 30 years of his life he had been smoking. And Alhamdulillah, after accepting Islam, he quit. He had been trying before, off and on, off and on, off and on. But after he accepted Islam, he put it aside and that was it. Uh, we know it can be done. And uh, people say, I oh, know, you know, you don't know what it's like. I smoked too. When I was a